Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Saturday morning, my Twitter was abuzz with discussions about rocket engine cycles involving such luminaries as Tori Bruno, as CEO of ULA. And, you know, people got particularly interested in the Expander Cycle rocket. And then, of course, Saturday afternoon, the Dragon situ situation metaphorically and literally exploded. But I do want to come back to the Expander engine because a lot of people seem to have a lot of questions and a lot of interest. Now, I did mention expander cycle engines in my more general video on fuel cycles, but uh, to give you a quick summary, when you have a high performance rocket engine, you need to have a high power pump that takes the fuel from the fuel tank and the oxidizer tank and it forces them into the combustion chamber at higher pressure. Now, you can do this in some cases, say, with an electric pump driving or an electric motor driving a pump, but most rockets do this with a turbine driving a pump, hence the term turbo pump. Now, the power or the exhaust, the gas to power that turbine, in most rockets, that comes from something called a gas generator. That's where you're burning a small amount of the fuel and oxidizer. And it's basically a miniature version of the rocket engine, blowing the exhaust gases over the turbine and driving the main pump. And then the output from that main pump goes into the engine. But for expander cycle engines, what they instead do is they take the cryogenic fuel and they float around the outside of the combustion chamber and they take that heat boil the fuel and then use the vaporized fuel to drive the turbines. So of course most rockets use this technique to cool the combustion chamber, but with the expander cycle engines this is the primary way in which they power the turbo pump. This engine cycle was actually used in one of the most successful engines in history, the RL-10. This design was developed 60 years ago and it first flew in 1963 on an Atlas. And since then it's been used as an upper stage on Atlas, Titan, Delta. It's even been used on the Saturn I. And it'll also be used in future rockets, in the SLS, in the Vulcan, on the Omega. And it might also be used as landing engines for uh, lunar landers. All the expander cycle engines that have flown work with liquid hydrogen as a fuel and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. Now the boiling point of liquid hydrogen is about 20 Kelvin. And you know, the engineering challenges of working with hydrogen frequently revolve around stopping it from boiling. But of course, when you need it to, it's great that it boils at such a low temperature. I mean, uh, it turns out that starting up many of these expander cycle engines is literally a case of letting the gas flow into the engine, which will be at some ambient temperature, which is well above the boiling point of hydrogen. And from there, that gives them just enough thermal energy to start the pumps properly and start the full engine cycle. But once the engine starts properly, it gets its energy from the combustion chamber. In the RL-10, the hydrogen is flowing through the walls of the combustion chamber, keeping it, of course, at very low temperatures. But inside of the combustion chamber, the temperatures are thousands of degrees Celsius and, of course, will melt practically anything you can think of. In the design of the RL-10, the liquid hydrogen comes into the engine through its pump. And from there, it's driven through the walls of the combustion chamber and the nozzle, where it absorbs a lot of heat. It boils, its temperature rises by a couple of hundred to a few hundred degrees Celsius. And then from there, the expanded gas flows through a turbine, which drives the turbo pump. And then as the gas leaves the turbo turbine, it then is goes into the main engine and of course meets the oxygen. Now there's obviously also an oxygen turbo pump. In the case of the RL-10, uh, the turbo pump for the oxygen is driven by a gearbox. Hydrogen is very bulky and you need to have pump a lot more of it. So you don't need nearly as big a turbo pump for the oxygen. In the case of the RL-10 also, I believe they use a two-stage pump for the hydrogen and a single-stage pump for the oxygen. This is actually a very efficient system. In fact, the RL-10 that's used in the Delta IV upper stage is currently the most efficient chemical rocket flying. It has a specific impulse of 462 seconds, although a lot of that is due to its very large nozzle extension, which I love showing because of the way it fits up inside the stage and then extends out during stage separation.
The only other expander cycle engine that I know has flown is the Chinese YF75D, which is used in the upper stage of the Long March 5. Uh, Europe is developing an engine along these lines. It's called the Vinci. It's going to use separate turbo pumps for the oxygen and the uh, fuel. Uh, Russia has the RD0146, which in theory may one day fly on their Angara rocket whenever that goes up. And yeah, there's a few other things floating around. Anyway, for comparison, let's look at another hydrogen oxygen engine, the RS-25. That's the engine that powers the space shuttle and will power the SLS. This is a vastly more complicated design using pre-burners and separate turbo pumps for the fuel and the oxidizer. And the stresses on the RS-25 turbines are way higher with the working fluid having temperatures of you know, four to 500 degrees Celsius and containing energetic combustion products that just want to react with anything. Meanwhile, the turbine on the RL-10, uh, it runs on neutral hydrogen gas and its temperature is, well, in some cases, basically room temperature. In exchange for all that extra complexity, the RS-25 does generate a lot more thrust with much higher combustion chamber pressures. The RL-10, by comparison, is only ever operated as an upper stage and it never is used to, to lift a spacecraft against Earth's gravity. Expander cycle engines like the RL-10 have problems generating high thrusts because the energy to drive the expanding hydrogen comes from the heat absorbed by the walls of the combustion chamber. And basic geometry says that if you were to scale up the rocket by scaling up the combustion chamber, that the, the area of the walls where the heat is being absorbed will grow as the size squared, whereas the volume of the fuel combusting will grow as the size cubed. So as you scale it up, it eventually runs out of enough heat flux to run this. And so you, you basically run into this kind of limit where you can't get any more thrust from an expander cycle engine. And there's a few different tricks here and there. You know, you can change the geometry of the combustion chamber to make it longer and thinner, but you know, that causes its own, own problems. But yeah, if you talk to people, it's suggested that the peak thrust or the you know, top thrust you could get from this is probably about 150 kilonewtons or 15 tons of thrust. However, there are more powerful expander cycle engines which get higher thrusts. It's more correct to call the RL-10 a closed expander cycle because all of the propellants, all of the liquid oxygen, all of the hydrogen end up flowing through the combustion chamber. The output from that turbine has to flow into the combustion chamber so that none of it is wasted. Now, since all the output from the turbines has to then go through the combustion chamber, that means the turbine output pressure has to be higher than the pressure inside the combustion chamber. And that means the pump that's powering everything has to have enough pressure to push all the fuel through the cooling channels, drive the turbines, and then get into the combustion chamber. And the performance of that turbine that's driving the pump, that actually depends on the pressure drop across that turbine. You know, lots of rocket engine design boils down to just balancing the pressures and the flows so everything goes in the correct direction and you're maximizing the amount of power you're getting out the other end. An alternate design simply dumps the turbine exhaust overboard into the vacuum of space. And this means that the pressure difference can be a lot higher, which means the turbine can generate more power, which means the pump can pump more fuel, which means the combustion chamber can be bigger and have higher pressures. And you might naturally call this an open expander cycle engine, but rocket designers that have actually built these things prefer the much cooler sounding expander bleed cycle. Japan has developed the LE5 series of engines using this cycle for the upper stage of their H1 and their H2 launch vehicles, but their, for their forthcoming H3, it will be powered by two or three LE9 engines running on the same expander bleed cycle. So this will be an expander cycle engine powering a booster, a first stage. By moving to the bleed cycle, the engines are able to generate 1.5 meganewtons or about 150 tons of thrust. And that's more than 10 times what you could theoretically get from a closed expander cycle. As you can guess, you know you lose some efficiency. You drop about 10% in terms of specific impulse, but you still get to keep those nice, cool, benign turbine environments. So you can you know, cheap out on the hardware there.
In the US, Blue Origin have also been testing an expander bleed cycle variant of the BE3, which has previously powered the new Shepard. The new variant is called the BE3U, and two of them are supposed to power the upper stage of the new Glen. The Blue Origin website specifies a combined thrust of 1100 kilonewtons, so that's about 550 kilonewtons per engine, which is a bit of a step down from the stock BE3, but I, I'm sure it gets better specific impulse. Um, incidentally, that BE3 that powers the new Shepard, that's also kind of a rocket science curio because it uses something called the combustion tap-off cycle. Instead of having a dedicated gas generator or pre-burner, it actually ha it takes uh, gases, exhaust gases from the combustion chamber and uses that to drive the uh, turbines. It's the only uh, rocket engine that's flown with this design as far as I can tell. So I've described two basic types of expander cycle engines, but of course rocket scientists are always inventing things and there is a fantastic article on expander cycle engines on the NASA website. It's by a guy called William Green and he worked on the J2X, which was supposed to be a, a better upper stage for the SLS. The project is currently shut down, but the articles are still up there and they make fantastic reading. And uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of some of these variants. So now if you remember that all these propellant flows require pressure differences between input and output of each step and pushing all that fuel through the cooling channels in the combustion chamber, that requires extra pressure. So one idea is called the closed split expander cycle where you have a single uh, shaft that's driving two separate turbo pumps of the fuel. and some part of the fuel goes directly to the combustion chamber and the other part goes through the uh, cooling channels and then dries the turbo pump. And in theory, this might get you some better performance, but of course it increases the engine complexity. A second concept is the closed dual expander cycle. And this uses you know, fuel expansion to drive the fuel pump, but it also uses the oxidizer to cool the combustion chamber and then uses that oxidizer to drive the oxidizer pump. Now, a significant engineering problem in creating and running rocket engines like this is making sure that the fuel and the oxidizer remain separate. And if you have a turbine connected to a pump and the turbine is being driven by fuel and the pump is pumping oxidizer, it's possible for the oxidizer to leak through the you know, bearing between the two things. So you need a very complicated sealed bearing what they will one of the things they tr or one of the tricks they use is they pump helium into the bearing to make sure that the fuel and the oxidizer never touch so by using oxidizer the liquid oxygen boiling it and then driving it to use allowing it to drive the turbine uh, you keep this separate until the very last minute so you can have much simpler bearings of course you're now having you know, a lot more complicated plumbing maybe this works maybe it's not I, i've only ever seen designs on paper for this there's also concern about having spinning metal in a pressurized oxygen environment because of its propensity to you know, make metal burn and of course, if you're a rocket scientist, you can combine both these tricks to create a closed dual split expander cycle, because why not? Uh, a final idea is to augment the heating with a gas generator and a heat exchanger. So you're, you're burning some of the fuel and oxidizer and you're using that to heat the hydrogen even more. And so you need, that gives you a bit more thrust. You're obviously dumping the gas generator over, but it's kind of a halfway step between a full open expander and a uh, full closed expander. I actually know that, saw that uh, William Green has a patent on this. So again, it's been designed, there's a patent that hasn't ever been flown. So yeah, that's my rundown of expander cycle engines. They basically take the problem off the heat and they exploit that to drive the engine itself. And it's a sound concept. The RL10 has been around for almost 60 years and it will be around for decades to come because it is a fantastic engine and a fantastic concept. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.